Jew and Gentile and into one church in Christ, we pray that you would bring the Dinka and the Newer into one body in your church and so bring reconciliation that transcends political and social and ethnic bounds and shames a world that lives so tribally. We pray for those Christians there. We pray for those Christians who may be Christians in name only because they have adopted Christianity in sort of a spiteful rebellion against their having once been forced to adopt Islam. We pray, Father, that their conversions would be made real, that in their experiencing the love of Jesus Christ through the preached word of your churches and your Christians, that their salvation would be true. We pray for those Christians who have left traditional religion and spirit worship to be discipled, to be grown up in the faith, to abandon the old and put on the new. And we pray that you would raise up training and sound doctrine among the leaders of the church there. And that the South Sudanese church would truly be a sending church. Blessing Africa and beyond with the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, here in Cleveland, we pray this morning for Asia Town. We pray that the churches of Asia Town would welcome the wide range of diversity in their midst and so also would display the magnificent glory of your reconciling power in the gospel. We pray for safety in that neighborhood and that you would um, bring peace on those streets so that uh, the people there can thrive and in safety and in comfort, know and hear and listen and attain to the gospel of Jesus. We pray, Father, for fair labor practices. We pray that the businesses in Asia Town would pay their workers what they are worth and what they deserve and what is right under the law, that they would treat them with respect and dignity. Pray, we, Father, we pray for the gospel witness there, but particularly among the Cantonese immigrants who are so unlikely to hear the gospel in their midst. And we pray that you would raise up Cantonese speakers to proclaim the good news of Jesus to them, that they might be healed of their sins and worship Jesus. Father, we pray for our church this morning, that we would be a people committed to discipleship. Forgive us in the ways that we have grown lax in our discipleship, the ways we have grown slothful and lazy, that we would recommit, Father, to a path of discipleship, that we would be looking out among us at who needs to be discipled, who we can disciple. We pray that we would be people who plan our relationships, plan our time together, to seek to do good to one another, to mold each other into the image of Jesus Christ, that we would preach the gospel to one another, that we might grow deeper and deeper into him, and that those who do not know him yet would hear and believe, because we are convinced and we know from your word that faith comes through hearing, and so may we be faithful speakers. May we also be faithful hearers as we turn our attention to your word this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. What do you, uh, well, let's, let's, let's read scripture first. Um, we're, we're in Luke. We're in chapter 22. We, we're in a series in the book of Luke, and we will be for, I don't know, about 10 more weeks. So if you'll turn uh, in Luke to chapter 22, we're on page 500 and. It starts on 573, but we are going to be on page 574 if you've got one of these Bibles. Otherwise, you do what you do to get to your Bible. And again, a short passage this week. Verses 54 through 65. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, 
man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another said, saying, another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now, the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. What do you think when you hear the word prophet? Generally, I imagine you view the word prophet with some level of suspicion. This is the 21st century, and we're all good modern humans. And we also have had a lot of bad examples of prophets that we might immediately go to in our head. Those who claim to be prophets generally fall into one of three categories. Uh, some prophesy things that just turn out to be false. They say an event is going to happen, and it doesn't happen. So you might think of like the Jehovah's Witnesses, among many other groups, who claim that their organization is the prophet, their organization is a prophet, and among their organization's many false prophecies is this one. Therefore, we may confidently expect that 1925 will mark the return of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the faithful prophets of old, particularly those named by the apostle in Hebrews 11, to the condition of human perfection. See how that turned out. A second category of prophets is those ones who say things that are so vague or common that they seem impressive to us in our more gullible states, but they really amount to saying little of anything significant. And this, this happens all the time, um, and it even happens among otherwise good Christians. So, so rather than pick on someone, um, I, I saw this was great. There, there's a satirical publication most of you are familiar with, the Babylon Bee. They reported on such a case that's typical in an astounding turn of events, the local Pentecostal Christians are calling nothing short of a miracle. An incredibly vague prophecy that could apply to nearly anyone at any time has come true. The astonishing word from the Lord delivered by an apostle at a prayer and healing meeting several weeks ago correctly predicted that local woman Sheila Blackman, quote, would see God shift her outlook or possibly some kind of change in her work life would happen at some point or else she would form a new relationship before too long, end quote. Very vague, very unhelpful, could apply to almost anyone in any situation. It's not very compelling. But sometimes in the moment we all fall victim. A third way we often think of prophets, though, is through a, a trick. A trick that we, we sometimes know as cold reading. It's commonly used by psychics and mediums, but unfortunately by many religious people who claim to be prophets. And, and by using a question and answer, format, these, these prophets use very specific sounding information and, and questions that are actually not as specific as they sound. A, a, and they use this information that's fed to them by the person that they're talking to to create the illusion that they knew something they didn't know. And sometimes they, they mix in with their what's known as hot reading or warm reading, which is when they actually know some background information. You know, so let's say this prophet who's well-known, is coming to town. And so what do they do? They put, a, they put an event on Facebook, right? And, and a thousand people click like they're interested in going to it. And some people even click that they are definitely going. And then you know what the prophet or psychic or medium can do? They can, they can look at those profile pages of those people who are going to the event. And then they can check out their relationships. And oh my goodness, John has a girlfriend named... Sarah, and Sarah's in med school, and Sarah just moved, and all of a sudden this prophet knows a lot of mysterious information about someone who just, their job got so much easier in the internet age. Um, this is going on all the time, and they vomit this information back to the person to make it sound like they knew their secrets. But when it comes to the actual prophecy part, they, they usually fall back on the vague and meaningless. You know, I see God really providing for your needs in the coming season, or a big change at work. What's a big change? 
How big qualifies as big? I never, they never say something like, I see you being promoted to executive vice president over sales in your company next week. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen, does it? So those are the three types of prophets we most likely come across. And so when I title a sermon prophet, you're probably wondering what's going on. You might be thinking, what are we talking about? And is this something that I want to have anything to do with? But these ideas are very different from the sort of prophecies found in the Bible. So I need you to kind of wipe those images out of your head. And it would be impossible in a a short time we have this morning to uh, really detail everything that Scripture says about prophecy. Maybe that's a, a Sunday school class sometime. But we've got a lot of different crazy ideas that are out there. We can't dispel them all. We can't dig into everything the Bible has to say about prophecy. But I want to give you at least a simplified oversimplified, admittedly oversimplified definition of the word prophet from a biblical standpoint. It's by no means a comprehensive definition as to how the Bible uses the word, but at least it gives us a a, a platform for this message. A prophet is a person who delivers God-given information about God or our relationship to him. A prophet is a person who gives or delivers God-given information about God or our relationship to him. Sometimes that information is predictive or future-oriented, but not always. In fact, not usually. If you look at all the examples of prophecy in the Bible, the ones that are predictive are the ones that probably stand out in our memory, but those are not the lion's share of biblical prophecy. So our passage this morning... We look at this uh, set of verses in Luke twenty two fifty four through 65 uh, by looking first at Jesus and then at Peter. These verses highlight that those who are followers of Jesus are called to prophesy about the perfect prophet. Those who are followers of Jesus are called to prophesy about the perfect prophet prophet. And so we'll, we'll look at Jesus first, and then we're going to look at Peter, and we're going to put this idea together. So I'm going to speak about Jesus first, and, and that might seem surprising to start with him, because he's not, the first, the, he's not the focus of the first section of this passage. At least Peter seems to occupy the lion's share of the attention. And then in the second part of this passage, Jesus is the focus, but it's two verses. But I want you to see that there's a terrible irony in this passage. As as it goes, Jesus is arrested. And he's taken to the home of the high priest. There were two high priests, actually, at the time. uh, Caiaphas and his father-in-law, Annas. And we know from John's biography of Jesus, the Gospel of John, that they took Jesus first to Annas and then to Caiaphas. And that Peter's story here spans both locations, but... But Luke has simplified the story to drive home what he thinks are the important points for his audience. And he wants to draw attention to Peter's response. Now, Peter denies knowing anything about Jesus on three occasions. We'll come back to that. But I want to focus on Jesus here. Three times Peter has an opportunity to acknowledge his relationship to Jesus. And three times he denies that. Earlier in the chapter, we looked at this passage a few weeks ago. Jesus celebrated his last meal with his apostles. Following the meals, the apostles discussed which of them was the greatest, which was a silly conversation. And Jesus rebukes them. And then there was this exchange between Jesus and Peter. If you look at verses 31 uh, and following in this chapter here, you might have to flip back a page. Peter, or or, uh, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. 
So at the meal before this happened, Jesus predicted this precise sequence of events. Jesus prophesied that Peter would deny him three times before the rooster crowed. And we said, prophecy isn't usually predicting the future, but sometimes it is, and this is uh, one of those cases. It's God-given information about God or our relationship to him. In this case, Jesus, because he is divine, God in the flesh, is delivering information that only he as God could possibly know, which is detailed information about the future. But Jesus wasn't just showing off. He wasn't just trying to impress people with what he knew. The information concerned Peter's relationship with God, with Jesus himself, specifically that Peter would deny him, which was at least a low point in their relationship. But Jesus also indicates in this message that he prayed for Peter. And that, as a result, Peter's faith will not completely fail, but he'll instead repent and turn back to Jesus. Now, Peter had just gotten done explaining to Jesus how loyal he was going to be, but Jesus explains, no, Peter, you actually won't. And that had to have been a really humbling message for him. Maybe he was indignant, not wanting that to be true. But it was true. And Luke tells us that when he was denying Jesus the third time, immediately while he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Immediately. That's the kind of specific thing we don't, we don't see with mo- most of our modern uh, fake prophets. But Jesus was a true prophet. His words didn't lie. They came true precisely the way he said they would, the way they ought to have. Jesus didn't tell Peter some generic and vague statement like, I'm getting that you're going to struggle here, Peter. There's going to be times coming when you feel some pressure to walk away from this. But you know, God wants you to hang in there, Peter. He doesn't doesn't say anything like that. Jesus says, Peter, you're going to deny me. Not once, not four times, three times. It's going to happen before the rooster crows tonight. Well, dang, Jesus, that's pretty specific. And it all comes true. Because Jesus is a true prophet. And so it's dripping in irony when the Jewish guards begin to mock Jesus. They beat him, and they do it in a very degrading way. They put a blindfold on him, and as they hit him, they demand him to prophesy to them, tell them some secret information. Whack! Tell us who hit you, Jesus. Whack! Who was it that time? Was it Simeon? Was it Yosef? Was that time, was it, was it Judah? Tell us, prophet. But they didn't know. They didn't know that they were playing a game with a true prophet who could have easily identified each one of them. But as Jesus said, this was their hour and the power of darkness. The irony of mockingly demanding the prophet whose prophecy had just only minutes before been shown true. Mocking him by playing a perverted parlor game of who done it. But there's another irony in this. The Jesus attackers are truly the ones who are blind because they don't see the prophet who was before their eyes and literally in their hands. But Jesus was a true prophet. His words were divine. And they tell us about our standing before God. Of course, if Jesus is a prophet, and then his disciples like Peter were perhaps beginning to wonder what other predictions that Jesus made might come true. For example, Peter might have had rolling around in the back of his head now all those things that Jesus had spoken in chapter 9, verse 22. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. 
I mean, he's already witnessing Jesus suffering and being rejected by the religious leaders. And that indeed was what was going to happen. He's about to be killed. And then this prophecy about Peter comes true and it authenticates all of Jesus' other words. It authenticates the rest of his message. And that message included the detail that he would ultimately be killed and he would rise from the dead on the third day because Jesus was a prophet, but Jesus wasn't just a prophet. He was the the better Moses. Even as Moses from the line of Levi was was a priest, a mediator between God and man. And even as Moses led the people as a a ruler, and even as he spoke to the people as a prophet, so Jesus is the prophet. He is the mediator, the priest, and he is the ruler. He is the king. He is a mediator, though. He is the priest. I mean, he is the prophet who is the priest. Because he is everything God is, he can represent God. And because he is everything a human is, he can represent man. And by his death, he made possible the reconciliation between God and man. He took on himself sin and all of the deserved punishment for sin, which is death, and allowed sinners who are waiting to die, whether they know it or not, to go free. All who surrendered their lives to him received mercy and pardon and forgiveness. And if you declare Jesus to be your Lord, your master, and you turn from your sins, your sins are placed on him, on his cross, never to be counted against you in God's court. He was more than a prophet, but he was at least that. But then we turn to Peter. Let's look at Peter here, because Peter is named one of Jesus' apostles in chapter 6. And uh, an apostle is literally a sent one. You apostle something, you send it out. That's what the, the Greek word meant. It was someone who was sent out with a message on someone else's behalf as an authorized representative, someone who was trusted to speak in the sender's name. A good modern word that kind of captures that idea a little bit is ambassador. We, we send out an ambassador, and the, and the ambassador represents the interests of the nation, and particularly the executive of that nation, and they are authorized to speak on behalf of the nation. They, they represent the king they represent or other executive. And, and, and so Jesus sends out these sent ones in chapter 9. He, he calls them in chapter 6. He sends them out in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So what did Jesus send them out to do? To proclaim or preach the kingdom of God and to heal. But do you, you see that they were called to send out, they were called and sent to preach, to deliver a message. Then later in chapter 10, Jesus sends out 72 disciples. So, so more than just the apostles, he sends out 72 disciples on a similar mission, which suggests that although the apostles were unique and particularly authoritative, all disciples are called to speak the message about Jesus. Now, we said that, that anyone who turns to Jesus as, as, the, as Lord, as master, as king, as ruler, as boss in their life, repents of their sins, has their sins taken off of them, placed on Jesus' cross and removed from them, that is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And to do that means obviously accepting his message. If we have trust in Jesus, then we trust in the words he's spoken and his message is one that offers salvation and a kingdom for sinners like you and me but that means in no small part that i and you if you are his follower have come to know and be entrusted with this good news 
You have good news. This, this good news, if you are a Christian, is from God. You have a message from God. And that message is for the spiritual benefit of others because if they believe it, if they trust it, if they obey it, if they heed it, they will receive the incalculable benefits of being restored into right relationship with God. So, Christian, you are a person with God-given information about God and our relationship to Him. What does that make you? Well, in no small part, that makes you something of a prophet. And Peter was a prophet. Now consider the circumstances that this prophet has found himself in. He's watched his master get arrested by an armed band of Jewish religious leaders and Roman soldiers. He's followed at a distance to see how this is going to turn out. He's ended up in the courtyard of the high priest. He's warming himself by the fire, and he's found out. A servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. Now, you might be thinking that seems pretty mild, but, but wait, you'll recall this is a slave, and slaves had very little social standing in first century Palestine. And then you'll notice this is a woman, and in first century Palestine, a woman's testimony was not even considered to be trustworthy or reliable. So this slave woman stares at him for a bit and then remarks, hey, this guy was with that Jesus they're interrogating, and this is about the lowest level threat that there could be to Peter. And what does the prophet say? Woman, I do not know him. A little later, a guy says, wait, wait, you're, you're one of them, meaning probably one of the band of Jesus followers. You're one of those followers, aren't you? You're one of those apostle guys. Man, I'm not. And then later, another man, probably noting Peter's accent, that he, along with most of the other apostles, had uh, heralded from Galilee, remarks, no, for sure this guy was with Jesus. Third time, I have no idea what you're talking about. No idea what you're talking about, dude. This is the prophet. This is the apostle. I don't know Jesus. I'm not one of his followers. Heck, I don't have any clue what you're talking about. Think of how Peter could have responded. As a prophet, as an apostle, sent to preach the good news about Jesus, he could have said to the woman, yes, I was with Jesus. He has the words of eternal life. He has saved my soul. Where else would I want to be? He could have responded to the first man. Yeah, those followers of Jesus are my friends, and I'm happy to be counted among them because we have found forgiveness for our sins and been brought into citizenship in his kingdom, the kingdom that he's building. I'd love to tell you about that. But he doesn't. He denies all of it. Christian, have you been asked about your association with Jesus? With other Christians? With the church? Did you respond like Peter? You're not one of those Christians, are you? Are you one of those, those like fundamentalist types? Do you hang out with like the super churchy people? When Peter denied knowing Jesus, denied following Jesus, denied knowing anything about this whole Jesus thing, he was failing in his role as an apostle and as a disciple. He was failing to be a prophet. He was failing to be a person who declares forth the truth about God, from God. He failed. And these weren't hard questions. These weren't terrible accusations. And there, there was no spear at his throat. There was no sword to his neck. What gives? Ultimately, Peter was more afraid of man than he was of God. 
fear of man drove him to deny his Savior. Does fear of man drive you to deny your Savior? Have you been confronted with the opportunity to prophesy, to proclaim out the good news about Jesus and what He has done for sinners and how sinners can be brought into right relationship with Him and kept that to yourself or muddled it or tried to make it more palatable because you thought maybe the truth would be too offensive? Have you failed in your call to be a prophet and a disciple? If you have, and I suspect all of us have, there's hope. And and there's hope in this, that Jesus looks at Peter. See that in in, in verse uh, 61, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. It's a deliberate act. It, It wasn't that Peter caught Jesus' eye. Jesus turns, a deliberate act, and looks right at Peter. Jesus sees his followers. He knows who are his own. He looks at them in the face. And that's scandalous in one sense. Because we know we fall short. And we know we've failed. And we know that we're weak and we're broken. At the other hand, it's comforting. Because nothing escapes his gaze. And when Jesus' face falls on his little ones, his weak and his imperfect disciples, they turn. Peter goes out and weeps bitterly. That's what it says. He weeps bitterly. He experienced grief and he experienced loss and he's weeping. But you know what? Sorrow is the proper response to our failing. Prop- sorrow is the right response to our sin. Our sin should grieve us. But not just any sorrow. Paul writes in, in 2 Corinthians, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. In fact, we can see that juxtaposition of griefs in Peter and Judas, can't we? Judas, who doesn't appear in this passage, but we know he's just betrayed Jesus. We saw that last week. And Peter, in his grief, is despondent about his wickedness and his failure. And does it lead to him turning to Christ? No. It leads him to turning inward on himself and committing suicide. The most exaggerated and and, um, specific form of worldly grief producing death. But not so Peter. Peter's grief is a godly grief. It's a grief that's born out of not turning inward, but looking squarely into the Savior's face. And seeing there, yes, that he falls short of the glorious Savior's standards. Yes, he falls short of everything Christ has called him to be. But seeing compassion, forgiveness, and love. And we know that Peter's grief led him to repentance. We know that he did exactly what Jesus said. When Jesus said, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day, until you, this day until you deny three times that you know me. He says, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus doesn't tell him, if you turn again, Peter, when you turn again. Because those who know Jesus, who are called by him, who are loved by him, who see their Savior's face, 
they turn. And they strengthen their brothers. And then we can read the sequel to Luke's gospel in the book of Acts. And boy, do we see Peter turning. Boy, do we see him strengthening his brothers. He boldly prophesies. He boldly proclaims the good news of Jesus in the face of all kinds of insults and injuries and threats, even to the point of giving up his own life. So have you failed in your duties to be a prophet? Here's the, here's the thing in this season, right? We're, we're going home to families where maybe we've been bad prophets. We've got Thanksgiving coming up and then Christmas and then New Year's. And my guess is that many of us have been bad prophets or, or false prophets among our families. Maybe we've denied our Savior. Maybe we've failed. Maybe we've hidden the gospel. Maybe we've sheltered that away. But now let our, our sorrow produce a repentance leading to salvation. Not just for ourselves, but for those we love. And like Peter, let us boldly proclaim the truth of Jesus. How might you do this over Thanksgiving or Christmas? What would it look like if rather than shirking away from your responsibility, your calling to prophesy, to share the good news of what Jesus has done, to share the good news of the great prophet? What would it look like to do that? How would your time with your family look different than it has in past years? How could you set aside time? How could you make sure that the gospel of Jesus is not hidden by your lips, but on the front of your lips? Maybe you, got, maybe you don't got anything good going on this holiday season. I don't know. But how could you do that at school? Have you failed to proclaim the goodness of the great prophet? Savior of the world, among your fellow students? What about at work, your colleagues? How have you taken time, set aside time, intentionally made time to bring the good news to bear in their lives? What about in your neighborhood, in your apartment building? How have you not spoken up of the name of Jesus? We've failed. And we know we have. And if you haven't, man, more power to you. Because I know I've failed. I know I've failed in my calling to be a prophet from time to time. But we look at the Savior's face. And we know that the same forgiveness that that forgives us of murder, that forgives us of adultery, that forgives us of lying, of cheating, of stealing, of hatred and enmity, also forgives us for falling short of declaring the good news of what he's done for sinners. And so let's turn and strengthen our brothers. Let's turn from a Godly grief that produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. And let us succeed where Peter failed, but where he ultimately did succeed. We're called to prophesy about the perfect prophet. So let's make good on that calling this week, this month this season. It's become a church that is known for its gospel witness. That's known for boldly proclaiming the truth of Christ even when it's hard, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's socially unacceptable, even when it might cost us something. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus and that it pays for all of our sins and even this one that we have failed to honor you with our lips, that you have called us to lay out the good news of Jesus for a dead and dying world, and we have secretly hoped that others would do it for us. Forgive us, God. Thank you that in our Savior's face, not only do we find our guilt, but we also find the love and strength to turn and be healed and to serve once again. May we be a people that does not dwell in our failings, but that we would be moved to grief over our failings and then move on from them without regret. May we honor you with our lips. May we honor you with our lips, particularly this holiday season, as we go home to unbelieving families. And may they have hearts that are receptive to the good news of Jesus. May we not assume that they will be hard-hearted, not assume that they will reject, not assume that they will be disbelieving. But let us instead assume that your Spirit is working ahead of us wherever we go to bring into your kingdom those who will hear and believe. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.